But to say, let's do what Anna Winter was talking about. Anna Winter did this video where she shares her fashion month favorites and go to interview questions in Go Ask Anna. This is an article from Vogue. I'm not sure how how interesting this is going to be, but let's have a look at what Anna Winter is talking about. Uh, interesting character in fashion, isn't it? It's weird that she exists, isn't it, still, isn't it? Again, that's why I said before, I think fashion is probably the only industry where gatekeepers still exist, where this sort of like steely looking uh, Caucasian lady with a bob and massive shades that, you know, don't fit her head can sit there steely faced and give you the kind of dead fashion stare and sort of like make or break your career. It's probably the only industry that still happens. Maybe the art world is similar too. There's not a lot of people kind of breaking the mold in the art world. A lot of this, I'm assuming a lot of contemporary artists, a lot of people studying fine art in university and colleges still want to be represented by a gallery or or like a, you know, a superstar curator or influencer or somebody of that like or kind of, you know, a taste maker in a scene. I don't know if there's a lot of people or a lot of kids out there who are organizing and making their rec centers. Remember Aaron Bondaroff when he made that rec center uh, in New York? when he kind of stopped doing a New York thing and he made that kind of like all-encompassing house where people could come in and perform gigs and record podcasts and all that sort of shit. Um, it'd be cool if a lot more kids did that, right? As opposed to like signing up to a gallery and stuff. But, you know, everyone's got their own interest to kind of abide by. But yeah, this is the video with Anna Winter talking about some of her fashion favorites. Let's hear what she has to say and then we can comment on it as we go, right? Let's bring the sound a bit, put it up, right? Get up in the screen. Hopefully, you can see that now. Let's play this and see what I should say. So, I should say, Hey, Anna, right? Oh. Oh, say, hey, Anna, look at hey, Anna. Did you just say it to your London? See, look at how scared everyone is at her, man. Maybe we can cut. It's a bit ridiculous, man, isn't it? Just a woman like Hi, everyone Anna, else. My question for you is What is your favorite? lunch break spot during paris fashion week and what do you order Jeez. of course uh the great Gigi hadid there coming off the back of you know absolutely eviscerating uh is it jake paul yeah jake paul so a favorite lunch spot for i don't want to let's find out G. who has time for lunch <laughs> hey anna um i was wondering um why did you like so much playing tennis and uh, what does it bring in your daily life? Marine, uh, because... She hasn't played tennis now, though, it? She looks very frail and very... You know, that's the one thing you've seen with her growing up with fashion. You, do, you have seen her get considerably older looking, but I also do like the fact that she doesn't try and, you know, uh, get work done and tons of plastic surgery, pull her face back. She looks very graceful. She, looks like, she reminds me of, like, Anna De La Russa, right? Um, older ladies who have kind of accepted that they're getting older and also kind of leaned into it. I think that's quite nice. It's quite cute. Um, it's quite sexy. And it does... It's very different, too. You can definitely spot somebody that looks their age as opposed to somebody else that doesn't because their face isn't, you know, pulled back. They don't have that shiny look. They, they don't have those pouty lips that are obviously full of fillers. It's really cool to see, actually. Um, let's continue. Because professional tennis players like yourself make it look so easy... Amateurs like me step onto the court full of hope and expectation that we can uh, serve like Serena or return like Roger, and of course that never happens. But I live in perpetual hope, and of course I'd love to play tennis with you anytime. Hey Anna, if you had to give a letter grade to the American, European, and Asian fashion industries on their progress as it pertains to diversity in the past five years, what grade will each one receive and why? Kirby, there's no question in my mind that America is leading the way in terms of representation on the runway. And I think we have yourself to thank and Virgil and Telfar and many other designers that work uh, both in New York and L.A. But the influence is also being felt in Europe. Look at the recent shows of Pier Paolo at Valentino or Ricardo at Burberry. And, and more recently, I felt that Sylvia Fendi also had wonderful representation on the runway. So don't you think the representation and conversation is very weird in fashion? Like fashion similar to like, it's like, um, it's like having, a, imagine talking about representation in music. Imagine that being a thing. Oh, we're not representing stuff in music. Like what would that even mean? Does that mean that the artists would have to, would that mean that you'd have to have certain artists from certain races have to make certain music in order to kind of rep get represented? Like, would you have to have black artists included in rock and roll, even though they don't want to do it? Would the same way be done with some white artists who don't want to do it? Like, it doesn't make any sense really, does it? Fashion is clothes. Clothes are worn by everybody. Everyone's into fashion. Everyone's into clothes. Um, brands should, at the very least, right, have their clothes mirror either 
I don't know, a segment of society that they want to be part of or mirror their kind of, you know, uh, mirror their, what you call it, mirror the people that actually buying the brand. I can think of just one example straight off the top of my head because of the Casablanca thing. Like, obviously, the Casablanca brand that, you know, the, this guy that used to be part of Big Al was now launched with the New Balance Catch that I spoke about previously. Um, you can obviously see the the inspiration behind that, right? It's this kind of like this dual national, this dual uh, citizenship that he has. Uh, you know, his parents are from Morocco, but he was brought up in Paris. The fact that he grew up and was surrounded by all the glitz and glam of the Parisian kind of fashion scene, but he's also got ties to you know his home country, North Africa. The fact that you know there's Casablanca's got a very luxurious sort of like ephemeral rock star Hollywood sort of uh, vibe to it that you could kind of lean into with a kind of Parisian chic. There's obviously some there's something representational in it, right? In the fact that it's what he's inspired by. So when you see the lookbook of Casablanca, you see people walking on a runway, they look exactly like what you'd imagine a brand to be like. So sometimes with these brands, the thing that annoys me sometimes with diversity question isn't that they should have X amount of black, Asian, you know, whatever people walking down the runway. It's the fact that the people walking down the runway should look like the people that buy your brand because in general, they're the ones that are going to keep buying it, right? That's why I never understood why a brand like Berluti a brand like um i don't know maybe fendi's even a good example where they have like 18 year old kids with like rosy colored cheek walking down their runway when most of the stuff they're selling is going to be north of a thousand pounds for like one item right and those kids are not going to buy it so why not have people on the runway who look like your actual customers now i'm not telling you to go and get you know some overweight guy from you know dubai to walk down the runway right and just waddling down there but have at least somebody that looks like some of, of the region that that guy's from because he's the one that's actually keeping your brand alive he's the one that's going to liberties and buying out the entire brand or going to your you know your actual uh, flagship store somewhere in west london so this idea that you know that you wouldn't have people that actually wear your brand or the people that look like people that wear your brand walking on the runway is weird. The fact that you'd have this weird conversation about, oh yeah, Pierre Paolo had some really good diversity. He had four black girls on the runway. It's like, what? What does this even mean? Like, who's he designing for? What language is he speaking? Uh, where's his inspiration based on? And then you kind of have your models uh, uh, represent what those kind of inspirations are about. Less about sitting there and kind of trying to tick off a list of kind of you know it's, it's like as if you've got all these emojis or flags and you're trying to tick as many off as you can so you can get down to the magical number of having over 50 percent representation it's a bit strange i never understand that fashion is again it's one of the only industries where there's gatekeepers and one of the only industries where people say with a straight face oh we have a diverse show this week or this month because or this season because we had four black girls and three asian dudes it's like what the fuck are you talking about so there's no question that diversity is on everybody's mind within the fashion industry and mind. way beyond. I just want good clothes. Hi, Hannah, it's Kate. If you could have dinner with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Kate, at a time when America seems politically and they were held, being held hostage, didn't they? I think it would be <laughs> very interesting and very helpful to have dinner with two men who stood for unity and common ground and belief in bringing people together and the two people i would choose would be nelson Donald Mandela Trump. and dr king okay. hi anna if oh, i were I'm an intern what Someone's would you make people. me do alessandro there is hi anna if i were an intern what would you make me do alessandro there is absolutely no question in my mind i would happily step down and let you run vogue Hi Anna, That's this it. season I was inspired by the Irish playwright Sims' work, Riders to the Sea, and I wanted to know what play have you found very inspiring? Simon, I was lucky enough to find one night oh, okay, right? during British nice. Fashion Week to go to the theatre, and I chose to see Tom Stoppard's Leopold Start, and it's an absolutely epic night at the theatre. Every single person in the audience was... I wonder if um, the kids coming up nowadays are actually interested in the arts as much as the generation that came before them or the few ones that came before that because i think that's what when you when you hear someone like a john galliano speak about fashion it rarely is just about the clothes it's always about more than the clothes it's about the books he's read the films he's watched the plays he's went to go see uh, the places he's traveled the people he sees on the street it's a lot of stuff outside of the industry of making clothes that informs the clothes he actually makes it makes it more interesting right they say, uh, what, what's that phrase? What's that, what's that quote about um, to be an interesting person, you have to be interested in things, right? Some, I think a, a very famous acting coach said it to somebody once. And I think that's very, very much something that could be attributed to fashion, to music, or to any creative endeavor. To do the actual best work and to actually say something interesting, have something interesting to say, 
would be to actually try and be interested in various aspects of the arts and you know you never know where inspiration can come from um from those different areas but again i don't know if kids nowadays are because again maybe there is a generation of children or generation of younger kids who are going to like alternative um kind of underground plays and kind of theater performances and you know all that sort of stuff but are they seeing the classics you know um are they going to the actual you know kind of stuffy fuddy duddy uh theaters and going to watch the actual classic classic classics and trying to get that to inform their vision of fashion especially through their young people's eyes i don't know i don't know but i hope that is a thing because i think that's what makes them interesting uh, i think that's what makes most people in fashion interesting where they have those you know very wide range interests interests outside of clothes sobbing at some point because it really touches on so many haunting subjects such as the Holocaust and the camps and losing and finding your family. Hey Anna, what is the last thing that made you laugh out loud? So the first thing that made me laugh out loud was Josh O'Connor's wonderful performance as Mr. Elton in Autumn to Wild's Emma. And the second thing was James Corden and Justin Bieber dancing off against very, very talented toddlers. Hey Anna, I hope you're well. If you're president for the day, what would you do? Sadly, because I was born in England, I can never be president. Of Hi Anna, what keeps you up at night? Well, obviously this is a moment of great transformation and challenges for the fashion industry and indeed the world at large. So, in that respect, there are opportunities. I think it's a moment for creativity and resetting and thinking about how we all go about our jobs in a completely different way. But I also think it's our responsibility at Condé Nast and specifically at Vogue to think how we can support each other, how we can support all the young talent that we work so closely with how we can be good partners uh, with all the different companies that we work so closely with, how we can reach and discuss with our audiences how they're feeling to build our community uh, to be even more impactful and aligned with the way that things are, are going. So I, I think we need to be a leader, we need to be a friend, and we need to be constantly ready to change. That's quite cool, man. That she's too, obviously, you know, super passionate about fashion still, isn't it? At this age, in this era, she's still not tired of it. Because, you know, the first thing you'd think of is like, why does she just retire and just enjoy her riches, you know, and sit back and become, you know, the the quote-unquote, you know, uh, martyr that she already is in general, isn't it? That would be pretty cool. But she obviously still gives a shit about fashion and cares about it deeply. So that's pretty cool to see. And again, is there anyone out there that could really do a better job than her now at the moment with, you know, the beast that is Vogue fashion or that is Vogue magazine? Um, you know, the, the breadth it covers, um, the place it has in the industry still, I don't know. Uh, but I still, it's still cool to see somebody that's at her stage in life, that's done all that she's done, accomplished what she's accomplished, that still has this fire to, you know, connect with the younger generation, uh, acknowledge them, give them a platform, and of course, kind of lead by example. Because I'd still think, you know, she is probably one of the most interesting people in fashion. Uh, you'd love to, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be caught dead. Uh, talking to her in a cocktail party right especially if you're an up-and-coming person you want to like not want to be anywhere near her because you want to say nothing stupid but it also might be a great time it also would be the best person to speak to too on your way to fashion stardom because she could probably give you some jewels that you would not be aware of previously due to her kind of you know extensive experience so again a really interesting person somebody that i think a lot of people should take more uh, heed to and again i'll link the show to in the show notes i won't watch the whole thing because it's a bit long but it's a really cool little interview there to check out if you're that way inclined. Klein.